Tharsden, he of eternal darkness. In the Athol Mountains south of the realm of Perrinland, a forgotten temple of great evil stirs to life once more. In ages past, foul rites were conducted therein by clerics loyal to the entropic deity, but that was long ago, and for an age, the place remained dormant and forgotten. Yet, a festering evil still lingered, a festering cyst upon the heart of the world. Recently, creatures of foul aspect have taken up residence within the temple's walls, sowing chaos and destruction to the land surrounding the place, and heroes are called upon to put an end to this evil once more. However, such corruption does not surrender easily, and death is but a minor fate compared to the soul-crushing reality to be revealed in the temple's depths. Come then, brave adventurer, and discover what lies within the Forgotten Temple of Thurisden. channel RPG Retro Reviews. I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school modules and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. This week I'm turning the Wayback Machine to 1982 and reviewing the Gary Gygax module, The Forgotten Temple of Thurisden. But first a quick word from Dark Wizard Games. Thank you for sponsoring this video. Dark Wizard Games latest Kickstarter is offering this outstanding fantasy game accessory the Dungeon Demon Fantasy Folder, super sturdy and high quality with a velvety smooth soft touch laminate that gives this folder a tough protective finish. Check out this beautiful full color art by Justin Davis. You get three folders for only $15. What are you waiting for? A link to the Dark Wizard Games Kickstarter is in the description. This module is a semi sequel to the module S4, The Lost Caverns of Sojkanth. More accurately, it uses the same locale and the Gnome Veil vale from that adventure, but little else. At least as far as what's in print between the two modules. However, in later interviews, Gary Gygax has said that it was the mage Sojkanth, the creator of the eponymous caverns, that defeated Thurisden's evil cult and acted as a conduit of power to allow the good deities of Greyhawk to imprison the malevolent entity. A somewhat important detail that might have been handy for DMs to have known in the module itself, but if you're planning on running this currently, well, <laughs> now you know. After his introduction in this module, Thurisden didn't see much use beyond a mention here and there in various releases such as From the Ashes, Night Below, and the Greyhawk Player's Guide. Of course, infamously, Gygax used him in his Gord the Rogues books from his company New Infinities, where Thurisden is finally released from his imprisonment and destroys Greyhawk. But I'm pretty sure everyone just pretends that never happened. Later in 2001, with the release of Return to the Temple of Elemental Evil, Monty Cook would retcon the Temple of Evil by linking the Elder Elemental Eye as an aspect of Thrizden. However, in an interview in Earth Journal 12, Gygax stated he meant no connection between the two. As to the creative origins of Gygax's Thrizden, one need only refer back to Clark Ashton Smith and his Lord of the Seven Hells, Thazayadon. Rob Koontz would adapt him for his own Kilobrun campaign as Thars Dunn, and eventually Gygax would adapt him for his own Greyhawk campaign as Thurisden. The module sequence designation for this adventure is WG4, but there is no WG123. Apparently T1, the village of Hamlet, was supposed to be WG1, the Temple of Elemental Evil, was to be WG2 and the Lost Caverns of Sochkanth as WG3. If you look at the level progression between the sequence of modules, there is a kind of continuity there, but of course, due to the politics of TSR at the time, Temple of Elemental Evil wouldn't be released until 1985. Another strange aspect of this module's production relates to its creative team, 
which was not part of TSR's own design department, but by outside creatives of Gygax choosing. Eric Shook designed the maps, and his mother Karen Nilsson did all of the artwork, which is very surreal and strange, further adding to the otherworldly feel of Thorisden's temple. The start of this adventure itself has the adventuring party attending a feast in the Gnome Vale at the Granite Hall, attended by the gnomish lord Gwalar. There, the PCs learn of the trouble the gnomes are having with a tribe of Norkers. Norkers are a kind of hobgoblin and were introduced a year before in the Fiend Folio. During the feast, the discussion turns to doing something about the incursions by these pests, and the PCs agree to investigate their origins and try to track them back to their lair. As a side note, always a company man, Gygax takes great pains to actually use quite a few of the monsters included in the then recently released Fiend Folio, such as the Caryated Columns and the Coffer Corpse. At this point, the adventure turns into a hex crawl and a wilderness map is provided. Now, I'm just going to say I really do not care for this map at all. It's just way too busy in my opinion. Fortunately, my friend Ernie Noah has a 5e conversion of the temple up on the DM's Guild for just $2.95, and that includes a bunch of wilderness maps, both of the hex crawl variety and several wilderness encounter maps, as well as direct conversions of the modules temple maps that you can use, which are specifically for virtual tabletop use. In any event, the trek to discover the origin of the Norker invaders begins on the upper northeast corner of the map. Obviously, having a ranger on hand for this portion of the adventure would be extremely handy. The area detailed is relatively small, however, with every three hexes equaling one mile. The wilderness here is, of course, mountainous and hilly, and the provided map goes to great lengths to reinforce this. There is a random encounter table provided for this area, with a chance of encounter being 1 in 20. The wilderness map shows 22 numbered areas, but not all of these numbers on the map have corresponding descriptions. Only the areas marked with an asterisk on this chart have individual entries. Thus, the DM is completely left to their own creativity to determine what exactly, if anything, can be found in the other locations. Location 9, the plateau of the Aracocra, will set the PCs on the correct path to find the temple. This small tribe of bird folk are having trouble with a mated pair of griffins and their nearly full-grown offspring. The Aracocra will agree to show the party the source of the Norker incursion, the Lost Temple in Area 15 if the PCs agree to eliminate the Griffins for them. The Griffins themselves have recently come to the valley after being displaced by a brass dragon that is lairing farther north. Of course, the party can always just plow their way through the wilderness blindly, perhaps following the trail of the Norkers if they can, but certainly it will take less time overall if they assist the Aracocra. Other major wilderness encounters include the Valley of the Lakota, and the Gorge of the Orcs, which is given some detail and a map. PCs can have some fun exploring this lair, but it is not integral to the adventure. Once the PCs find the Lost Temple, the real meat of the adventure begins. An aerial view map of the temple is provided. The temple is reached following a narrow path along a cliff face, which then leads to a narrow stone bridge across a steep ravine 100 feet deep. The bridge leads to a plateau on which the temple resides. The temple itself is constructed of basalt and a kind of two-step pyramid. The upper section is 80 feet square and 40 feet high, while the lower section is likewise 40 feet high and 160 feet square, and seemingly melds into the plateau itself. The bridge track leads to a steep ramp that in turn leads to the upper story of the place, and it's here that entry to the temple proper can be gained. Defense of the temple itself is pretty well described, as you can see here, with reinforcements arriving all the way out to melee round 25. While it may be relatively easy for the adventurers to capture the upper level initially, reinforcements will arrive soon after and include not just Norkers, but Ogres, 
trolls, giant trolls, hill giants, and even a mountain giant. Hill giants and the mountain giant will toss boulders at fleeing combatants or roll them so they follow the track and over the narrow bridge over the ravine with expected results. In addition, if the party doesn't clear out the temple within a week, more monsters will arrive from around the region to take up residence in the temple. However, once the initial mob is defeated, with the stragglers fleeing to the lower temple, exploration of the temple proper can begin, and the module transitions to a dungeon expedition and clearing out those stragglers. So far, other than the black basalt construction of the temple itself, nothing exceptionally weird has happened to the party. But as they explore the temple further, that will change. The dual stairs descend into the lower temple. The north wall here has peculiar properties that can only be barely discerned with normal vision. Movement of some type can be seen within the walls, but only a gem of seeing or dower more of equal ability will reveal the parade of robed worshippers marching to a gate of oblivion. Play from here will mostly consist of clearing out the stragglers that haven't already been slain by the PCs and noting the peculiar properties of the place as they go along. In all likelihood, play will proceed here till they reach area 15 and the stairs will lead to the dungeon level of the place. However, the middle section of the lower temple contains a chapel. This place, long abandoned, offers some weird and strange experiences. It is mostly of black obsidian but the floor and walls of the chapel further back are of a strange purple color. In the 10-foot area 17 on the map, those lingering too long or touching the wall here will become disgusted by bright light, be flooded with strange desires, and will inadvertently speak the name Thrizden without intending to. What might be fun here is for the DM to hand a player a slip of paper that tells them to say, Thorisden out loud as weirdly or creepily as they can manage and then look as surprised as anyone else that they even said it. The railings and carvings on the floor and ceiling around the chapel depict vines and tendrils, tentacles and serpentine bodies intertwined with human forms, skeletons and other unknowable things. The Lovecraftian nature of the place is really powerful here. Clerics risk death merely by touching the dais in Area 20. The most important section of this level is Area 3, the Mauve Chamber. Here in this room, the polished obsidian floor has pyramids incised on it, one every few feet, the point of the thing northward, while the base points to the south. Looking up at the ceiling reveals a bas relief carving that shows tentacles and human figure patterns interlocked but so intricate as to make exact identification impossible. There is a secret door on the west wall that leads to an inset section that is below the entry stairwell. This inset area is really the key to the entire place, and its contents are required to successfully navigate the final portions of the adventure. Here, the party can discover priestly robes and helmets of Thrizden. They have a minor enchantment on them, which will allow the wearer to escape cold damage and other such things in the under temple and cyst sections, as well as an iron horn whose haunting reverberations will be required to open a secret portal to the hidden cyst. But more on that in a moment. Note the shaft on the south wall here. It leads 300 feet down into the under temple. The next major section of the temple is the dungeon level. This can be accessed through Area 15 in the Lower Temple. Some 100 steps descend into this black-walled, rough-hewn section. Let me take a moment to mention that the map here is extremely mundane when compared to the descriptions of what the characters find here. In many sections of this module, I really had to read and reread to completely understand what was being presented, and even then I wasn't exactly sure what was supposed to happen. This is especially true once you get to the cyst. A few art pieces depicting the more complex sections would have been extremely handy, but what we were provided with is walls of Gygaxian text. With that said, the Lovecraftian nature of the place definitely comes through. This temple exudes evil and it twists the mind just by being there. The first section encountered in the dungeon level is a large column with massive 
10 foot tall stone idols along each of its side, one black, one green, one red, and one blue. Gygax takes the time to give very detailed descriptions of each of these idols, which are all different depictions of humanoid followers of Therisden, haunting robed and armored figures bearing a filigreed scepter, flowing robes depicted in stone, wearing masks or a cow that completely hides the face of the thing. Either way, all of them are hauntingly creepy. Only by blowing the horn from the inset area will the real wonders of the place be revealed, as these statues form translucent and then apparently disappear altogether, revealing a vaguely humanoid shape draped in purple robes and a sepulchral voice booming out. What of eternal Thrizden would you see? If the party doesn't answer, then they are chastised to Go back, meditate, and follow what instructions given to you by the wise. However, there is a whole list of possible answers. Strength, prowess, might, wisdom, skill, death, knowledge, etc. In which case, the purple swath figure appears to speak and answer based on what was asked for. More of a generic reply with a fill in the blank for the thing requested. Then the column will slowly return to its previous state. Mocking or asking for something that doesn't meet the specified criteria results in tentacles of colored light springing forth, touching each party member and inflicting weakness, confusion, fear, and feeble-mindedness as per those spells. With a booming voice saying, Seek forgiveness by faithful service, or the doom which brushed you will return tenfold. Coming from the statue, and the thing then returns to its previous state. And this is all a complex illusion, however, and voicing of strong disbelief will allow for a save versus magic to throw off its effects. Other sections of note in the dungeon area are the crypts and the massive cave section to the north. Here, any remaining giants will make their final stand against the players. Interestingly enough, an exit from the mountain can be found by following the cave passage to the west. If the PCs missed the secret door to the inset area in the lower temple, it's entirely possible that they could consider the adventure complete having vanquished all the monsters that had taken up residence in the place. However, the temple holds a few more nasty secrets and horrors if they do discover the secret area under the stairs. As mentioned earlier, priestly robes and iron horn, the Wailer of Thorazden, can be found here, but also balls of incense, iron torches, as well as several thurables, a metal sensor in which to burn the incense balls. All of this will be needed to successfully navigate the under temple and the cyst section. To the south of the inset area is a square shaft that descends via iron rungs 300 feet down into the belly of the place. The under temple leads to a trapezoid chamber with a trapped demon, a hexagonal room with five strange tree-like formations that can provide some interesting stat boosts based on character class or take it all away if a character is too greedy. But it's the octagonal chamber that is important here. On the east, west, and south walls of this room is a pyramid symbol. Touching it will cause a 10-foot radius purple shaft of light to suddenly emote from the ceiling to the floor. Blowing the horn at this point causes a column to rise from the floor where the light illuminates. The room gets frigid and cold damage can only be avoided if the PCs are wearing the provided priestly robes. The black shaft rises to touch the ceiling. Gray vapors erupt, obscuring the entire area. The gray mist can be cleared in a 10-foot section by putting the incense balls in the space provided in the thurible's and swinging them back and forth. They also must light the torch cones provided. This allows passage to the black column, revealing an archway and stairs circling downwards within. Touching the gray vapors causes damage based on whether a PZ is wearing a robe or not. Also, one must avoid touching the wall of the shaft as they descend downwards or take damage from needle-like protrusions. Finally, the long descent ends in an equally sized 10-foot circular room with an exit to the south. This leads to a larger circular room, and here 
the name of the place comes unbidden to the lips of all those entering. The Black Cyst. There's a faint light illuminating the center of the place, revealing a black shape that absorbs all light. This thing is covered in sharp needle rock, a block of weird, pulsating and undulating, writhing stone. At the foot and head of the thing are cressets, where the provided torch cones can be placed. Sounding the horn again after setting the torch cones in the cressets causes the south wall to tremble and reveals yet another secret room. Here a variety of strange and interesting magical items can be discovered, trapped of course, the 333 gems of Therisden and a book of black scaly hide which requires a read magic to discern its title, which is Lament for Lost Therisden. Of course, those who are not priests of the entropic deity will take up to 30 points of damage for their trouble and have their mind blanked for up to 12 rounds. What the party is to do with these discoveries is left to them. Destroy them or sell them to interested parties, but undoubtedly non-believers in possession of such a holy relic will certainly attract attention of the most vile sort. While not described in the module, certainly attempting to read the book's contents will have adverse effects on the reader. I would liken this to the Necronomicon from the works of H.P. Lovecraft. However, this is all speculation as the module abruptly ends. It should be noted that the revealed descent shaft as well as the supplies for opening it are limited and the time it remains open is up to about three hours. Thus, it's entirely possible for a party to linger way too long and get trapped. The artwork by Karen Nelson for this module is weird, which is certainly appropriate given the material. There's a surreal quality about it. Some of it is quite good, while other pieces are convoluted and bizarre. I honestly can't decide if I like it or not, such as the cover art, which very much does sort of match Gygax's description of the robes and the weird snake-like tentacle motifs that abound around the temple. My one criticism here is that there isn't enough of it and that some of Gygax's more elaborate descriptions could have used some illustrations to more clearly convey what is being presented. Likewise, the maps are quite mundane here, frequently just presenting empty squares where a bit more detail would have been handy. This is a double cardstock cover module the outer cover depicting the wilderness map and the inner cover depicting the orc gorge lair, the outer temple area, and the upper lower inset and dungeon levels of the temple itself. If you'd like a bit more detail, I can't recommend Ernie Noah's virtual tabletop maps high enough, which do a great job of adding color and detail to the temple's innards, as you can see here. Only $2.95 at the DM's Guild, and if you'd like to convert this to 5th edition, then Ernie provides stats for all of that as well. The PDF for this module is available at DriveThruRPG for only $4.99. So, let's go ahead and take a look at the Forgotten Temple of Therisden on my D20 scale of style, presentation, and value. The style here is early 80s TSR trade dress. Gygax went out of house for the artwork and maps for this module, and it shows. Karen Nilsson's surreal artwork occasionally provides some creepy atmosphere to the proceedings, but it is never functional or aids in filling in the details of Gygax's frequently lengthy descriptions. Further, the maps themselves are quite minimalist, even by 1980s standards. The wilderness map is atrocious and barely usable. I didn't care for this kind of wilderness map for the Lost Caverns of Shochkanth, and somehow Eric Shook managed to make this one even worse. I'll write this in 11. The presentation here is uneven. I do enjoy reading Gygax's lengthy descriptions, but all too often, the flowery details make discerning what is being presented difficult and multiple readings are required. This becomes more pronounced the stranger things become as one progresses deeper into the temple, especially in the under temple and black cyst areas. The format here is a bit strange as well. Much of the well done detailed descriptions seem to be meant to be read aloud but there's no demarcation between what is DM information and what is player information, which makes things a bit clumsier than they need to be. With all of the negatives thus stated, this is a pretty good adventure. It starts off as a monster hunt through difficult to navigate mountainous terrain, and then turns into a very challenging lair assault. After that, the adventure transitions again to a more typical dungeon exploration, but 
with things getting progressively weirder and more bizarre. There are sections in the lower temple that the monsters of the place won't go. Places that just being in make you queasy and the presence of some heretofore unknown evil entity seems horrifically overpowering. The dungeon level further cements this weirdness, but doesn't quite overstate it. There's even a part where you can just exit the place and leave well enough alone. But then again, that deep shaft in the inset area beckons, even though it hints at further horrors. The transition to the under temple is utterly weird and surreal. The way the column and the octagonal shaped room rises from the floor and the entire area is saturated in gray myths. You've already descended 300 feet down a narrow shaft to get to this place. Do you dare go deeper? Puzzles abound and the sheer unnatural cold is death. The rocks jut out and tear at you. If you do not don the garb of the evil priests, it's even worse. Consider the act of wearing the robes and swinging the incense burners to clear the gray mists to reveal the purple-hued shaft of circular stairs leading down. And then, as you reach the very bottom, the name of the place comes unbidden into your mind, the Black Cyst. It's all very trippy. Dim the lights, put on some creepy music, and lower your voice as you describe this hideous, otherworldly place to your players and they should be adequately horrified and awed. This really is Dungeons & Dragons at its most creepy, Lovecraftian horror best. Once the final treasures of the temple are revealed, the module ends, and the ramifications of what's discovered is entirely left to the Dungeon Master. Certainly, if the characters fully explore the temple's evils, they will emerge, forever changed, with the knowledge of the evil entity's existence. I'm going to rate this a 17. Finally, let's talk value. Auction prices vary greatly here with anything from $35 on up. It's not too overly priced, but still expensive. The PDF is just $4.99. The module is the typical TSR length of 32 pages, so it could easily be printed out. And this is a very good scan from drive-thru RPG. I'll rate this an 18. And that brings the overall rating for the Forgotten Temple of Thorisden, 46. Very good. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you found this video fun and useful. I'd like to thank all my patrons and supporters. Without you, this channel would not be possible. Please give this video a like, comment, and share. Please check out my Teespring store for great gaming swag, t-shirts, carry bags, coffee cups, and more. Join the channel's Facebook page, RPG Retro Reviews, and consider supporting the channel by becoming a patron yourself. Or alternatively, you can just send a tip through the PayPal tip jar or even use Super Thanks, which is now activated. A link is in the description for everything. And as always, my friends, may your D20 roll true and game on.